Okay, so we're going to do the abnormal findings of dermatology. Most of this stuff that you're going to see is stuff that you've heard about, whether it's a, um, uh, an abscess to certain kinds of skin cancer to psoriasis to eczema. So we're going to talk about all these different things. And just a running list, light and fluffy. Most students can do this on their own, but you'll have a video of this too. Okay? So, um, so let's deal with burns. So that's dealing with the skin, all right? Burns. Um, there's three. There's actually four degrees of burns, depending on how deep the burn is. If it's just going to burn, if the burn is just going to affect the epidermis, then we call it a first degree burn. And uh, this, you'll have pain and you'll have redness there because the nerves are still there and the nerves are traumatized, so you're going to have some kind of uh, pain there and you'll get some redness, uh, which is inflammation. If it goes down into the upper portion of the dermis, so all the epidermis is burnt, and then you're going to go down deeper, now you may start getting blisters. And of course, pain is there because the nerves are traumatized. Then we go into the third degree. And the third degree is that there won't be any pain. This is usually going down to all the dermis, and it's going to affect all the hypodermis also. Now, in the hypodermis, you're going to have a lot of nerves there, blood vessels. So what's going to happen is those nerves are going to get destroyed. And what's it going to look like? Well, you're going to have some blisters there. It'll look nasty. It'll look very charred. Okay? And the thing is, this is where the situation is. It looks worse. Well, it, look, it looks bad, but the person says, well, I don't feel anything, so it can't be that bad. When really... The pain is good, as I've always told you before. Pain is a good thing. Pain is going to get you to the hospital. But if a person doesn't feel pain, unfortunately, I've seen this many times in the hospital setting, they usually wait to the last resort. It's like, ah, it doesn't hurt, so I don't, know, I don't need to see uh, a doctor or urgency care or something like that. When really, darn right, that's pretty bad because it went down so deep. This is a third degree, but it won't feel, you won't feel any pain because the nerves are destroyed. That makes sense, right? The nerves are down deep, okay? Now, there is a quote-unquote fourth degree. Um, we don't really refer to it. That's why I put it in parentheses. Basically, it's the same as a third degree, but it also incorporates all the underlying muscles, whether it's muscles or tendons, um, or if we actually get to the bone itself. Um, so a lot of people don't refer to it as a fourth degree. They just say that it went down to the bone, all right? But there is technically a fourth degree, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if people actually use that, though, okay? And there's no such thing as a fifth degree, okay? So um, you're going to see some gruesome pictures here. I think everybody here is going to go into medical field, so just getting used to the clinical aspect, all right? Um, and this is just showing you in cartoon way, schematic view, how deep the burn will go. You'll start getting blisters. So this is normal. This is first degree. And you can see where the epidermis is up here. And then if it starts dealing with a second degree, dealing with the dermis, you're going to start getting blisters. But in a third degree, the whole dermis layer gets destroyed, and it's going to also deal with a lot of the hypodermis area, too. This here is just showing you a first degree. And you, you, I'm sure many of you have had a first degree where you touch a, fr uh, a, high, uh, a hot frying pan very fast and let it go of it, and you got a little burn there. And it hurts. That's a first degree. But when you start seeing blisters, it went down deeper. And that's what's showing over here, a second degree. When you start getting bone and muscle involved, you got yourself a third degree. Okay? So the complications that we have to deal with, not so much in the first, maybe a little bit of second, but definitely the third degree, is that we're going to have massive infection. We just open up a doorway because the skin is the first line of defense so that bacteria can't get into your bloodstream. Well, now we destroyed the skin. So now you just open up a window, a gateway, for bacteria to pour in there and it'll go into your bloodstream. So we have massive infection that it can occur, especially for third degrees or quote unquote fourth degrees. Also, too, you're going to lose a lot of fluid, all right? Because the fluid is, wants to go to that area, so you're going to lose a lot of fluid throughout your body to go down to the area where the burn is because it's going to cool up that spot. Does that make sense? So you're going to have dehydration going through. Yeah, well, septic means that they're gonna. Yeah. Septic means is that the bacteria go into the bloodstream. That's what septic means. Someone has sepsis, and someone is septic, they're gonna be in an intensive care unit. Okay. 
okay? Because if it goes into the bloodstream, where does that go? To your brain, to your kidneys, it goes all over the place. So your whole body becomes what we call septic. And it is the 11th killer in America right now, okay? So it's up there. Um, so we gotta figure out, well, treatments is, if those are the complications, then the treatments is for that, right? So you can have antibiotics to make sure that we can try and tone down on that infection if it's possible. And obviously just pour and pour a lot of fluids into their bloodstream because they're going to get dehydrated. Okay? Um, now, how can you estimate how much of the burns does that person have? Well, we have this rules and nines that we do. And depending on how much got burned tells us how much fluids we have to give that person or what the antibiotics are. And you should be able to do this. It's kind of a fun thing. It's called Lone Browder's uh, method of estimating how much, the percentage, how much of that person got burned. And it's a rule of the nines that we have here. So if you look at this picture over here, everything is divisible by nines. So you get this estimate. In other words, if the person burns the front of his head, then that's four and a half percent. If they burn the front of the head and the back of the head, you've got nine percent. Does that make sense? If it's just the front of the, the trunk here, that's 18 percent. If you do the front and the back, you're going to have, what's that? 36 percent. You see what I'm saying? It's pretty easy. I think if you look at this, and you can see the legs over here and the arms and so forth. So I, you're going to have to do this on the next exam. But I think if you look at this for a measly three or four minutes, you'll have it all memorized. It's not so bad. Think of, you know, you would expect that the head doesn't have that much percentage compared to the trunk, right? All right. So, um, in fact, the front of the arm has the same percentage as the front of the head. All right. So looking at this pretty easy, and you would just have to, you know, if I said to you, someone burnt the total part of it, uh, the, uh, the front of the person's face and the front of the arm, the whole arm, and the front of the, the trunk, I think you could figure out what's the percentage if you estimate that. So what is that? The front of the face, the front of one arm, and the front of the trunk. What does that come to? 27%, right? So you have four and a half, four and a half, 18. Right? Pretty easy, right? I think you can see the math on that. Okay? So don't want to spend too much time on that. You should be able to do that, though. All right. So let's look at a whole bolus of different, um, uh, not bolus, but a whole brigade of different signs, symptoms, and diseases, most of these you have heard about. Okay? Skin lesions. A lesion is any kind of area that has visible change to the skin from a disease or injury. Okay? So you say it's a lesion. We'll use lesion also like a spinal cord lesion, which means there's any area of the spinal cord that's traumatized. So a lesion is going to be one of these terms you'll be hearing often throughout the rest of your life. So this is just a rundown. I'm not going to spend time on this because it's more like flashcard kind of fun. But a scale is a flake or dried epidermis. A good example of this is dandruff. Okay? A psoriasis, which we'll talk about also, is a good example of that. A bulla is a blister. Okay? It's just a large fluid-filled elevation. All right? A vesicle, this is what you see with herpes or chicken pox. It's a smaller, it's a smaller than a bulla, uh, and that's just what it is. It's a fluid-filled area um, with elevation, okay? But it's smaller than a bulla. And a chicken pox is a good example, which is a, uh, in the same family as herpes, believe it or not, okay? We have a macula. A macula is a flat, discolored area. A freckle is a good example of this, okay? Or an age spot. We have a papilla, where it's going to be a small raised area, but it's not filled with fluid. It's a solid thing, and it's less than a centimeter. A centimeter, well, there's two and a half centimeters that are in one inch, so it gives you some idea what a centimeter is. And a good example of a papilla is a wart, okay? You've seen these things, okay? A crust is a dry ex uh, exudate. An exudate uh, uh, was originally something that was liquid that just dried up, okay? Uh, so we have a dried exudate. Uh, epitigo is a good example of this. Epitigo is a highly contagious uh, infection that occurs, in, uh, we should see it in uh, infants and toddlers. Uh, and an exudate is fluid from a tissue that is now uh, dried up a little. Okay? Um, a tumor is any solid mass that you see growing on there. Okay? Uh, it's also extending deeper into the dermis, though. Okay? Um, 
as opposed to a papula, it doesn't go down into the dermis, it just stays from the epidermis. And a good example of this is basal cell carcinoma, uh, melanoma, those things on there. Um, a polyp is, a, um, basically, it has a stalk to it. So this is the top of the skin, then a, pap, um, yeah, a polyp would have a stalk to it and then a big bulging thing on there. All right? Uh, a nasal polyp, a skin tag, those kind of things would be there. Okay. Um, then we have a pustula, and this is a small area that's containing pus. And a great example of this is simple, a pit pimple, a zit, acne. Okay, and that's what that is, filled with pus. An ulcer is an erosion of the epidermis, and as, if it's more severe, it goes down to the dermis. So it's big, uh, it's a gaping uh, hole, per se. Uh, we usually see this with uh, bed sores, and I'll show you pictures of those later on. Um, a wheel is this isolated area that is filled with fluid and it's <coughs> raised and it's usually red and itchy. A good example of this is hives or an insect bite. You get uh, a mosquito bites you, right? You got that little a wheel that comes up, okay? Um, Utica is just a condi condition of having hives all the time, okay? That's what Utica is, or Uticaria. A cyst is a thin walled area that is filled with fluid. All right? And a sebaceous cyst is a good example of that. Okay? Um, a fissure is a crack. You have a dry lips over here and they start cracking. That's what a fissure is. Okay? Um, what else we have? Alopecia. Alopecia is baldness. All right? Men have pattern, uh, you know, uh, male pattern alopecia. Okay? So that's what that is. It's a loss of hair. Okay. So this is just showing you in picture form how far they're going. You can see where the epidermis is. You see where the dermis is, and you see what each one of these are and how far they go. So it gives you an idea of what these are. And you can see it on here too. Um, I'll say it's like, it's like the same thing like your stomach. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's it's away. So technically, on the skin, there's a big gaping hole there, like a crater. In the stomach, you have a big gaping hole. So you'll be using these words. Um, uh, uh, a canker sore, that's another one that's, a, that's an ulcer that usually heals up on its own. So yeah, any kind of gaping hole, a crater, whether small or big, would be an ulcer. Mm -hmm. Okay? And these are more of the same things, but looking at a different way. So now let's go through some of the diseases and using those terms. This is uh, dermatitis. Dermatitis, we could have contact dermatitis. If you have something, itis means inflammation of, derma, skin. So this is inflammation of the skin. If you're allergic to something, like, uh, like Band-Aids or something like that, you can see that there's an area over there that gets inflamed because you've got a, um, an um, inflammation going there. If you have inflammation of the connective tissue, we call it cellulitis. Okay, most common in the legs and face, and it's usually due to some form of bacterial infection. The symptoms, SX's symptoms, is painful and they get redness in those areas. We call it erythema, which is a fancy word for redness. But you could have figured that out because you know what an erythrocyte is, right? Which is a red blood cell. Okay? And MC, by the way, stands for most common. Okay? Acne vulgaris. Vulgaris doesn't mean that it looks vulgar. In Latin, vulgaris means the common type. There's different, there's different types of acne. This is the more of the common type that you usually see all the time. And it's basically the sebaceous glands in there produce excessive amount of oil and block the pores. And when it does, the, build, the back bacteria build up in that oil. That oil is a wonderful place for bacteria to grow. They just hardy hardy there like kids going to a pool. They just are magnetized to that area. And they love to flourish, these bacteria love to flourish in oil. And that's what happens with that. Uh, peruncle. I, I just love to say the word peruncle. But it's a boil. Okay? It's an abscess of a hair follicle. And an abscess is a collection of pus that usually has bacteria, white blood cells, and any kind of debris that the white blood cells are destroying in there. Okay? Uh, usually the treatment for any kind of boil is that we're just going to cut it and let it just drain out. Uh, something we call an IND or incision and drainage. You can 
see a, a big abscess there. You could give a lot of antibiotics, but it's not going to do much because the abscess has a wall on it, and it's difficult for the antibiotics to get into the uh, into the the abscess area. So the best way is just to cut it open. If it's big, cut it open and let it just drain out. Okay. Herpes simplex, right? This is the herpes. This is the gift that keeps on giving. Once you have it, you can't get rid of it. Okay. Uh, it's a viral infection and it's painful. All right. Uh, you should have a fever. It could be a fever blister. Um, it could be just on the genitalia itself. Chicken pox is also in the same form of this. Um, well, th there's like six different types of herpes viruses, and chicken pox is one of those. Uh, shingles is there, and that's, as you know, it's a sexually transmitted disease. It's self limiting. Uh, you, once you have it, you have it, and usually it goes away in a couple of, it could go away in a week or so. Um, but you have it, you're going to get more prone to getting it, uh, especially if you're stressed. When you get stressed, this usually happens a lot more. Uh, there's no cure for it, as you know, but there are antiviral medications that what they do is that they decrease, uh, once it, you have the eruption of it, it decreases instead of a week, it might cut it down to five days. Or if you have, if it starts happening like every month you're having the herpetic lesions that appear on your lips or anywhere else, well, what they'll do is the antibiotics will actually cut down instead of every month, maybe it's once a year. Like it'll cut down on that, but it can't totally, you can't get cured from it, okay? And the only way you can pass this on to someone else is that there has to be one visible. Just having it there in your bloodstream does not do anything. It's, uh, it, it has to be in the, um, in the fluid that's inside there. So what I'm trying to say is chicken pox. All right? Chicken pox, the most contagious time to get it, uh, to pass it on to someone else, is when you have these uh, fluid-filled areas there. But then after about a week, those fluid filled other areas, they bust open or they get absorbed, but it looks dried and you have all that dried exudate that's on there and it looks nasty. Even though it looks nasty, that's the time it's not contagious because there isn't any fluid filled areas there. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so it's, it's the fluid that's in there, not the dry stuff. It's the fluid. When you, that, that's the stuff that gets passed from one uh, person to another. This is uh, my feet. No, <laughs> uh, this is uh, something I guess when we look forward to. These are fungal infections. These are onychomycoses. Anything mycoses is some kind of fungal infection um, of the neon. The problem is with fungal infections, they take up to a year, or at least a minimum of a year, to get rid of it. All right. Um, the treatments are there, it's just difficult to get rid of on the nails. I mean, how long does it take? If you break off your nail right to the bottom, and you have to wait from the bottom to get to the top, it's going to take like a good couple months for that to happen. But there's still fungus, fung fungal areas inside of where the nail bed is, and that still gets passed on, so uh, or goes further on. So it does take, God bless you, it does take a long time for fungal areas to clear up. This is also a fungus. Um, it's called tinea. Now, the laymen call it ringworm, and I don't like that word because it's kind of a misnomer. They kind of are misleading on that because when you hear ringworm, you think it's a parasitic worm. It has nothing to do with worms at all. I guess because it's a ring, but I would call it a ring disease, not a ringworm. I don't know where the worm came in. But, um, but anyway, I'll show you pictures of it. It's a fungus, and depending on where this fungus is on your body, they have different names for it. Tinea corporis means that you have it someplace on your body, like the, the trunk of your body. The tinea capitis, the cap, the, uh, the cap of your body, the head, that's where that is. Uh, tinea cruis is jock itch. Okay? Um, tinea pedis, pedis, meaning foot, that's athlete's foot. So it's the same thing. All right? It just depends on where it's located. And that's usually what it looks like. All right? If you had it or if you've seen it before, that's what it looks like. These don't usually take that long. Well, they can take a long time because it's a fungus. Um, but yeah, just showing you different areas of what can occur. You can see it on here. All right, you see it on the, on the scalp over here. And this is kind of embarrassing. You know, if a child has this and now they go to school and they want to wear a baseball cap because they don't want to be made fun of because they have these areas that hair can't grow because the fungus is there, they get made fun of. So you got to have some sympathy to all this. And unfortunately, like I said, this can take like a year to actually make it go totally away. you got to have some sympathy with this when you get into the medical field and, and have other avenues of what to do with the kids. You've got to worry about the, the child's psyche and what they have to deal with, especially in today's day and age with bullying. Okay? 
Okay. This is vitiligo. Uh, we talked briefly about autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases, and I'll just refresh it. Autoimmune diseases, someplace, for some reason, your body is fighting against itself. Why? We don't know. It's an autoimmune disease, and it's idiopathic, meaning like we don't know the reason. Idiopathic means we don't have a reason for it. We know what's happening. We don't know why it's happening. And an autoimmune disease, we have them all over the place. And we'll talk more about these later on throughout AMP 1 and 2. In this case, your body is making antibodies, which is usually going to fight foreign things, but it sees your body as foreign for whatever reason. Certain parts of your body see it foreign. And you'll learn about this when you get into uh, osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis. Because rheumatoid arthritis is where your body sees, uh, makes antibodies and attacks your joints. In this case, vitiligo, their body makes autoantibodies and it attacks the melanocytes from producing melanin. And what happens is it doesn't go on throughout the whole body. It's parts of your body that it doesn't produce melanin. And that's why you have these patches that look like very pale. Okay? And this is vitiligo. Sometimes it's on the face. But it goes away. It comes and goes and comes and goes. Three months, it'll be on the face. Then it goes away. And maybe three months, there's no issue. And then four months later, it shows on the hands. And then it goes away. And then it shows up on your feet. This is the theory of what... This is what I heard, okay? I, I don't know, but this is what I heard from Michael Jackson. He had vitiligo, okay? He also had lupus. That, that's, that's definite, and we'll talk about it later. But um, oh, we'll talk about that in AMP, too. But um, the, um, they, my understanding is he, people thought that he had vitiligo, and he was having these bouts of blotches all over his face, and he didn't think that was aesthetic to his fans. So that's when he decided with his dermatologist or whatever, let's just bleach the whole skin so that it's all pale or all lighter. And that's the theory, that's the reasoning, my understanding why he bleached his skin if he did that. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, don't quote me, but that's my understanding about that. And there's nothing bad with it, it's just an aesthetic thing. Okay? All right, gangrene. Gangrene is tissue that's destroyed, all right? It dies down. We call it necrosis. Anything that's necrosed is that uh, the tissue has been destroyed, okay? And this could be due to ischemia, which means poor blood supply going to that area. The tissue's going to die. It could be diabetes, and diabetes actually causes ischemia, so it's less blood flow going to that area. And we'll talk about that another time. Frostbite. Right? The, the tissue itself gets frozen, and now blood can't get there to give it nourishment, oxygen, and, and nutrients. So that tissue is going to die. Okay? When it does, the skin appears very black. And you can't do anything about it. You can't resurrect that tissue. That tissue is dead, uh, and you can't do anything. Uh, the problem is, because it's dead, there's no skin that's really functioning properly. So again, you just destroyed the first line of defense so the bacteria are able now to get inside the, the tissue. So that, that area that's gangrenous, all right, or necrosis, that area has to be removed because we just opened up a doorway to allow this bacteria to come in there. Okay? So usually we'll have to do some sort of amputation to that area. All right? That tissue's gone. It's dead. You've got to cut it... Uh, did you have to well, show pictures of it? So here's gangrene, right? And gangrene is where, well, necrosis is dead. When infections get there, now it's gangrene because it produces, um, when the bacteria get there, it produces a byproduct, which are a lot of gases, uh, a lot of uh, byproducts, and it has a, like a very bad smell to it. That's what you usually smell with, with the uh, dead tissue. So necrosis will lead to. Um, Gangrene. So if this area here is dead, we have to amputate it here. Otherwise, it's going. This gangrene is going to spread further up. Does that make sense? So you have to cut it here before it spreads up, and that's what they'll have to do. This is a pretty uh, graphic one, but uh, there's not much you can do with this. The best thing to do, and you can probably see some redness up here. So there's some cellulitis and stuff here also. The best thing to do is just to cut it below the knee, 
And uh, because it, there's nothing you could do with this. It's just a, it's it's like a wick that um, uh, that bacteria is just going to go to and is able to go inside. We'd have to get rid of this wick. I know it sounds gruesome, but it's the best thing for the person. All right. You want to cut off the, the foot over here. You don't want to cut off the whole leg. You just save the whole leg by cutting off over here, right below the knee. So then we also have a uh, decubitus, decubitus ulcer, which is a bed sore. And basically what this is, it's also called a pressure sore. Basically what's happening here, and we see this a lot in nursing homes, or where patients aren't moved over from one side to the other. They have a stroke on one side, they can't move themselves. So they're, sitting, they're lying on the bed for a long amount of time. So think about it, you've got bone, you've got skin, tissue over here, and then you've got the bed. Does that make sense? The bone, you're lying on there. So the, the skin, the tissue itself is being sandwiched between a bone, a hardy area, and the bed. When you sit on there a long time, the bed becomes hard. It's not cushioning anymore. So it's being pressed together. So now blood vessels that are bring, trying to bring blood to that tissue can't get it there. They're being compressed. So that area, if it's there for, let's say, seven, eight hours, it's not going to get perfused with all that blood supply. So that tissue is going to start dying down and cause these ulcers, gangrene and stuff. And that's what's happening over there. They get the new product and die down. So this is where it starts off. It goes further down, further down, and starts breaking up. And they turn into things like this. Okay? This is a totally preventable thing. If you're going to be taking your mother to a nursing home, they're not, you're not going to ask them, so what's your percentages of having ulcers? They're going to say, oh, it's, a, you know, it's, it's 0%. Because they know it's a preventable thing. They're not going to advertise that we have, oh, we only have 25% ulcers. That's not a good place. I always tell my mother, you know, treat me well. I'll put you in a good home. No. <laughs> but I'm saying that it is preventable. You just got to make sure that the person is moving over. If they had a stroke like this, they can't move over. They have to rely on someone else to move them over so that they, they, the, the pressure's on, on, uh, on their side for a long time. Um, and that's what that is. Okay? Eczema. Eczema is inflammation of the epidermis. Okay? So it's skin inflammation is, is the most common reason for this. And it's extremely itchy. When you have extreme itchiness throughout your whole body, we call it pruritus. And it's an allergic reaction. Common sites you usually see this is on the hands, uh, on the elbows, okay, uh, back of the knees, the head and face, and it's more common in children. Okay, uh, basically you get this dryness of the skin and exacerbates the uh, the dryness of the skin exacerbates the eczema. And the treatment is really given some kind of steroid creams, all right, to cut down on the inflammation, moisturizer so it doesn't get too dry. But there is no cure for it. There's only treatments. And sometimes with this, these are just signs and symptoms. You don't have to worry about all this. If you understand what these are over here, you'll be fine. Um, but I want you to be aware of these common diseases that are out there. Um, but a common triad that we usually see is if you have asthma, um, I think it's about, last time I checked, it's about 40% of people who have asthma, they also have hay fever and eczema. So we see this common triad. So if someone has eczema, ask them also, do you have asthma, do you have hay fever? These are other things to also think about. It's not everybody, but it is a common trial that I want you to just alert you to. Okay? And you get eczema over here. It gets extremely itchy. I don't see children as bad as this, but sometimes you've got to do that because they'll be scratching themselves. You just can't, you know, can't tell a two-year-old don't scratch, they're going to start crying. And it, it, it's, it's irritating, right? Uh, itchiness is a form of pain, actually. So that's what's happening. You can see here on the back of the knees and stuff. Okay. Psoriasis. These are where normal skin cells grow too quickly. You know that cells are always growing. They have a fast turnover skin cells, but this happens to be 10 times faster than normal. So now the skin cells, they start forming layers. The epidermis starts forming layers. And it looks like there's scales on the skin. They don't come off. It looks like you could actually pick them off, but they will bleed. They're not, they don't actually fall off, okay? And I'll show you what that looks like. You've probably seen some of this or on yourself or, or a family member or something, or a friend. So you have these silverly scales that start growing on there, and you have these layers that happen, okay? Uh, nails could also be affected, because that's part of your skin, okay? Common sites you usually see is the knees, 
the scalp and also the elbows is very common. You see it also on the finger, on the knuckles too, I see that too. And treatments is really uh, steroid cream, there is no cure. And I don't know exactly how this actually works, but phototherapy using UV light cuts down on that also. Okay, but you've probably seen it on people. Uh, it looks like it scales like you could flake off, but they don't. And this is not contagious. So I want you to understand that too. If you have a friend or a spouse or something, that is not contagious. It looks bad, and there's certain medications that cut down on that, but it's not contagious. Okay? Who's that? Is that Kim or I lose track of all these people? Is it Kim? Okay, she has um, psoriasis. Not very tell open about it, but she does. All right, so I kind of put people up there, um, celebrities, to try and help her remember. Why was Kim on it? Oh, she had the she had the psoriasis. You know what I'm saying? So you remember those kinds of things. Not that I'm discriminating or telling like who has it, but usually you know we're more visually oriented, and people remember students remember um, when we put celebrities up there and when they have them. So, so you'll be seeing them throughout my all my lectures. Skin cancer. Can't talk about skin without the skin cancer. Well, basically, there's three major ones here. And the, the major risk factor, as all of you learned probably from kindergarten, the major risk factor is sunlight. Okay? We have basal cell carcinoma. This is the least malignant, malignant but um, it, it is the most common. And when I say malignant, it's, it means that it can spread someplace else. Uh, basal cell carcinoma, very easy to treat. You just remove it, and about 99% of cases, it's fine. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common. It's kind of 50-50 where it can spread or it might not. Uh, melanoma, that's the most aggressive one. That's the one that's least common, uh, thank God, but it is the most lethal. All right? So before I talk about those, medica uh, those uh, a little bit more about those cancers, I just want to talk briefly about actinic uh, keratoses. This is a precancerous growth. So whenever you see on your skin or on your own... Um, uh, on your, your uh, mother or your father, you see certain that things, that lesions that weren't there before. Mom, is that okay? Why don't we get yourself checked? Because if it is, a, if it is this thing here, it's precancerous. Get rid of it so it doesn't become cancerous. At this point, it's safe. All right? But you don't want to leave it there. It's like doing a pap smear. If you have an abnormal pap smear, that doesn't mean that it's cancer. It's a precancerous thing, like dysplasia or something. We could get rid of it before it becomes cancerous. All right? So this one can lead to what we call squamous cell carcinoma. Notice the word carcinoma. Notice squamous cell. All of that should make sense if you know histology. These words start popping up like that. Okay? So basal cell carcinoma, this is the most common form of skin cancer, but luckily this is the one that's uh, cured. About 99% of cases, it does get cured. If they see it early, you just remove it, and you have to go and get a full checkup. Usually, um, I don't know how it is, like it's twice a year for the first three years or so. Uh, just And they do a full body in between your, your fingers and in between in the groin here, they, in between your toes. I mean, a full workup you got to check, especially if you have these things. All right? But this is the, I wouldn't say this is the one you would want, but I'm just saying this is the one that is curable in 99% of cases. The squamous, the squamous cell carcinoma, this involves the keratocytes. And this one uh, is mostly found on the scalp, um, on a, someplace on the, on, the, on, the, on the head or on the hands. Um, and it's treated usually with surgery or radiotherapy. It tends to have a good prognosis. It's like in the middle of the two. The one that's really bad is this one here, melanoma. It looks like a bruise. But if you didn't hit yourself and you look like you have a bruise, you start questioning, what is that? Okay. Um, luckily, this is not as uh, uh, common as the other ones, but it does account for about 3% of all cancers, melanoma. Okay. Uh, and basically what it is, is you could figure it out, but the melanocytes become cancerous. And the risk factor, obviously, is for uh, sunlight. And if you're light-skinned, you're more exposed to the sunlight, it'll destroy more of your melanocytes. Well, this one, why it's bad, is very, very aggressive. This one is highly metastatic. It will spread easily to your lungs, to your liver, to your bone, and to your brain. So if you have it over here and you have it in the liver, you've already got fourth stage cancer. Okay, so this one is very easily spreads out to different areas. And the problem is, is that chemotherapy, taking medication through the IV in here, they really don't do anything. You have to do some sort of 
uh, surgery or what we call immunotherapy that will help with this. Okay. So these are just what we call the ABCs. I won't ask you much about this for your FYI. When you see something new on your skin or something new on someone else's uh, skin, just ask yourself, you know, is the two sides of the area, does it match? Is it perfectly round or is there like a, some kind of edge to it that, that doesn't match on the other side? Is there a border that exhibits indentations? Um, the color, is it black, round, that kind of thing? Um, diameter, if it's larger than the size of a pencil eraser and it's something new, do get yourself checked and see if it's elevated. So these are what we call the ABCs of looking at uh, skin cancer. And yes, Hugh Jackman, he had melanoma. If you go back and read about it, he actually had something on his nose that was removed and he's cured of this. And that's what he got on there. Um, Bob Marley, uh, I'm sure you all know about him. Bob Marley, he died in uh, 1981 at 36 years old. He had um, an area, this isn't his, his foot, but it was very similar. He had something on his toenail and by the time he got himself checked, it was already too late. He died at 36 years old. It's pretty young, but that's what happened with him, uh, with Bob Marley. Okay. Medical surgical procedures. Uh, you can do those on your own. I won't ask any questions. It's like an FYI: um, skin uh, scraping, culture sensitivity, debridement. Uh, we talked briefly about incision and drainage for, for an abscess. Um, cryosurgery with the freeze things. This is just like I said, FYI kind of things. Electrosurgery. Um, laser surgery, you've probably heard of all this kind of stuff. All right, and other different types of biopsies they may have to do. All right, and just show you what a point of biopsy is. It's not too bad, the skin. All right, 